So as we begin, let's bow our heads. Father, speak through me this morning, and let it not be my words or my message. Let it be all you, and let your words, your message, speak to each and every one of us this morning. We love you, and thank you for being with us. Amen. Amen. 2.30 a.m. On a morning at about this point in time in the year, though several years ago, during my senior year of high school, my alarm clock went off. On a normal morning, my alarm clock wouldn't have been set for anywhere near 2.30 a.m. Because that's not time to actually wake up or get up or be up unless you're up that late, in which case, not me, but some people may be like that. But 2.30 a.m. my alarm clock went off because this morning was different than most other mornings. This morning, we were getting ready. I was going to join with a bunch of other students, and we were leaving on a trip. And being the prepared person that I am, I thought ahead and said, okay, there's almost every time, and this may be like you, I know that at least this, this is for me, that most trips that you take that are out of the city that you live in or out of the valley here, um, whether it be by car or plane, generally about an hour and a half to two hours driving out, Maybe when you get to the airport, maybe when the plane is taking off, you have a light bulb go on over your head, figuratively speaking, that says, ooh, I forgot something. I, I think some of you might be like that. And being the forward planner, forward thinker that I am, I, I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna pack everything that I can think of ahead of time, and that way it will get the juices in my brain going so that that last minute thing I might be able to remember before uh, leaving on the bus. Because once we're on the bus with a group of kids, unless it's a life and death emergency, there's no going back. So 2.30 a.m. the alarm clock goes off and I get out of bed and thinking to myself, okay, I'm gonna go through the checklist of what I have. Realize, okay, I've got everything together and the bus won't be here to pick us up for about another 45 minutes to an hour. It's 2.30 in the morning, I'm tired. I didn't get to bed on time. So, here we have a dilemma, a decision to make what to do with 45 or so minutes worth of time at 2.30 in the morning. And each of the possible decisions that I have has in and of itself an opportunity cost. For one, I could go, I could take my bags, I could leave the dorm, and I could go out to where the bus is gonna pick us up and be incredibly early, but the opportunity cost of that idea is that I'll freeze my butt off, because this is a cold Canadian spring, and the place that we're traveling to is not in Canada, and it's not cold. So I don't really want to get all of my winter stuff on to go and wait to then be toting all of my winter stuff around the final destination that we're going to be at. So that's not that good of an opportunity cost. Next, next option that I have was just hang around my dorm room and think around with some stuff or just mess around with some stuff and just let time pass until the a little bit closer to the time the bus has arrived to pick us up. And the problem or the opportunity cost with that is that I have a roommate and those of you who are married have the mentality, or you might have heard this saying, happy wife, ha happy wife, happy life. Well, the same kind of idea is true with the roommate, because if you take your roommate off, they're the ones who live with you and they can make your life kind of miserable. So you don't really want to uh, ruffle too many 
roommate feathers or to rock the boat too much. And so I'm like, okay, well, that's not that good of an option. And, and the third option is uh, take a little bit of a power nap. <laughs> and then uh, obviously the opportunity cost of a power nap is that the power nap might be a little bit longer than what you <laughs> originally planned for it to be and you might miss out on the trip entirely. So here we have opportunity cost. The cost involved with making a decision. Last week we started out uh, using this illustrative game show style illustration and we brought up an imaginary contestant and said as a group which door should our contestant choose? And the group of us together picked door number two, but like most game shows, generally they bring an element of suspense in, and so the door that was least cheered for was door number one, and so we opened up door number one, revealing a fish, and we talked about all the different ways that Satan tries to tempt us and lure us into traps. And the way that we avoid the traps that Satan sets for us and avoid being caught in them is to draw a line that we're not going to cross in our beliefs. However, as we continue our opportunity cost game, like many of you know, generally after one door has been chosen, the host comes back to the contestant and says, would you like to stay with door number two, or do you want to switch to door number three? And so this morning, I'm going to pose the similar question, should our contestant stay with door number two, or should our contestant switch to door number three? So. <coughs> Who all here with cheering, making some noise, thinks that our contestant should stick with door number two? Okay, how about door number three? So I think that door number three is a little bit of an edge, but that was close. That's door number two? Okay, door number three? So our contestant is going to choose door number three. He's going to make the switch. And I applaud each and every one of you that cheered for door number three for the simple reason that if I've learned anything from movies and statistics, most people wouldn't make the switch. So this morning, we're going to show you what you didn't choose by opening door number two. <laughs> Door number two, what does this remind you of? Sleep. Sleep. You turn 30 dilemma. <laughs> Sleep. Because that's the option that I chose that morning, uh -oh. taking a power nap. And the next thing I realized there was a loud pounding at my dorm room door at 5.30 in the morning, two hours after the bus was gone, and I was not on the bus. Being caught sleeping is never fun. However, being However, falling asleep isn't necessarily the issue, as we're going to look at this morning, but instead the issue is going, happens to be uh, what you do in preparation for falling asleep, or for the time that you might fall asleep or will fall asleep, and then the decisions that you make after you've been woken up. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at one of the parables of Jesus, 
and we're going to unpack the idea behind sleeping and being caught sleeping and planning beforehand and what to do afterwards. And so if you have your Bibles, whether they be physical Bibles or electronic Bibles, flip in your flip pages or swipe over to Matthew chapter 25. And we'll be reading Matthew 25, starting at verse 1, going through verse 13. And we're going to be talking about a parable of the ten bridesmaids. Many of us may be familiar with this parable, but I want to unpack something that may be hidden on the surface with this parable that relates to being caught sleeping and the planning. Starting in verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming! Come out and meet him! All of the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. <clears throat> now, while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. The kingdom of heaven is like ten bridesmaids. Five were wise and five were foolish. However, all ten of them fell asleep. So in just that little snapshot, we can understand that both that at some point every one of us is going to fall asleep, but we also can understand that falling asleep in and of itself is not the issue. The preparing beforehand, the five wives, bride, bridesmaids, prepared, they thought ahead, they thought, well, we're not entirely sure when the bridegroom is going to come, so let's plan ahead and let's bring a little bit of extra oil. The five foolish ones didn't even have that thought cross their mind. They may have been to many wedding feasts in the past and thought, well, the bridegroom's going to come and we're going to just all go in and have a good time. And we can look at the preparation and the thought process to understand that thinking ahead and anticipating a time when each of us may fall asleep is a good first step because none of us know the day or the hour of the bridegroom coming. And as I think about my own life, I can say in some respects, I wish that he had come a long time ago, and it would have made a lot of sense for him to come a long time ago, but I kind of like existing, and I like all of my friends here, so I'm glad that he hasn't at least come till I was born. <laughs> and then we move to what, at least in my mind, is a little bit of the key, and I'm still wrestling through some of the details with this train of thought as I analyzed it over, but what I think makes the wise bridesmaids wise is not necessarily the preparation ahead of time, even though that was something that was a very wise thing to do, but instead it has to do with what they did when they were startled awake. Once they after they were caught sleeping and had woken up. If you can put it back up on the screen, I didn't plan this. Um, Which verse? 
So, start at verse 6. Where it says, At midnight they were aroused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. And the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. So they all come together, and they all decide, Okay, the bridegroom is coming. We're going to get our lamps ready. All of them group together. That's a smart thing to do. The bridegroom's coming. Move on to verse 8. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. They begin to realize that they hadn't fully thought ahead. They hadn't really planned for this unexpected delay. And they were stumped. Continue to verse 9. <clears throat> but the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. Verse 10. But while they were gone to buy oil, this is the key that I'm wrestling through in my head. Because the foolish bridesmaids made a second foolish decision in this parable in that they left where the bridegroom was coming to go out to try to get oil, to try to get something else, and then the bridegroom came. And I'm wrestling through in my mind with this idea because we have other parables about wedding feasts where the invitation is sent out to a group of people and the group of people don't really think that much about the invitation and they kind of slough it off. And then the host throwing the wedding feast invites everybody that will come. There seems to be no limit to who gets invited in. And kind of tying that parable to this one, I can see kind of a theme that, that says not having the oil, while it was bad, what ended up being worse was that they left, for lack of a better way of describing it, their post as bridesmaids, thinking that they needed something else. Another way that we can look at this, or look at the Bible and understand that sleeping, being caught sleeping, isn't in and of itself a bad thing, but what we do to prepare it and what we do after it comes in the story of Jesus as he's caught sleeping on the boat in the storm. He, leading up to that point, they Let's put it up on the screen. It's in Luke 8. There's three different uh, spots. There's three different uh, Gospels that describe this event. And we're going to look at Luke 8, the Luke's account. Luke 8 and 22, and it's up on the slides. One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. <clears throat> As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. The storm stopped and all was calmed. Then he asked them, Where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man, they asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and waves obey him. Jesus, knowing everything, knew the time and place that he was going to die. And it wasn't in a storm while sleeping on a boat on a lake. And he had complete faith and trust going into his nap that God would take care of him. And Jesus' response and action 
immediately coming out of being caught asleep, startled awake, was appropriate. Silence. Be still. And it's, we discussed this a little bit at the 10 o'clock uh, discussion time, that the disciples were both a little terrified and amazed at what just happened because it's very likely that they stirred him awake to help them either sh like row the boat to shore or to grab a bucket and start pitching water out. Help us, we're gonna drown. But instead, they witnessed a miracle that surprised even them. So falling asleep isn't the problem because we all are gonna fall asleep at some point. But it's what we do now to prepare for it, and what we do when we're startled awake. Jesus, there's another event in the Bible, in the Gospels, that illustrate this as well. And this is in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night that Jesus is about ready to be arrested before his trial, before he is crucified. And this is in Matthew chapter 26. And starting in verse 36, we read, Then Jesus went with them, this is the disciples, to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. So he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he said to the disciples, or then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed in into the hands of sinners. Up, oh, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. Jesus, Jesus' words to Peter have significance for each and every one of us. I believe it's verse 41. If we can put that up and leave it on the screen for a moment. Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Just before this time, before they arrived at the garden, Peter, or Jesus had told Peter, you're gonna deny me. You're gonna, before the rooster crows twice, you're gonna deny me three times. And Peter was absolutely like flabbergasted at the, even the idea of ever betraying Jesus. But when you're tired, when you're not awake and alert, it's easier to fall into temptation. And we can see Jesus telling Peter, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. I know what's coming. I know that you're going to be uh, in an uncomfortable situation and that you're going to end up denying me. But please stay awake. Keep watch so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing. I know that you want to do what is right, but the body is weak. <clears throat> in our lives, Oftentimes our spirit is a lot more willing than our body is able. We like to say a lot of good things. I'm going to do this. I'm going to help here. I'm going to do this. But 
when it comes down to it, we have a limited resource called time. And oftentimes, time ends up slipping away from us. And we looked at it last week. We looked at the idea that the devil tries to lure us away, lure us into a trap. But that's not the extent of what the devil tries to do. Because even the devil considers it a win if he can just get us to not prepare and to fall asleep. In each and every one of our lives, and I'm including myself here, I'm guilty of this, I've fallen asleep without preparing. I've fallen asleep physically, but more than often than not, I've fallen asleep intellectually. I've fallen asleep spiritually. I've fallen asleep intellectually, letting years go by without even challenging my brain. Like, too often, life just seems to happen to us, and days, weeks, months, even years go by, and we haven't done anything that challenges our mind, think, causes us to think deeper, think more analytical, think more just on the surface, day-to-day -day emergencies, day-to-day -day dilemmas. But in order to prepare for what's coming, we need to stay alert and awake and to plan for the eventual falling asleep that may or may not happen, but will happen in your life at some point. The spiritual falling asleep, though, is even a little bit trickier because too often life will try to crowd out anything that's remotely spiritual. It will try to crowd out church, but more often than not, church kind of becomes a habit, but outside of church, our life tries to crowd out personal study because too often we end up going through life, days, weeks, months, years go by, and with the exception of church, our Bibles sit on the shelves. Or if we have electronic Bibles, the app remains closed. But Jesus, like he said to Peter, is saying to each and every one of us, keep watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Keep watch. Look around. Don't kind of zone out looking at a screen. Like, pay attention to life. Look at what I'm doing. Look at the things that are going on around us. Look at the relationships. Look at people. Look at the people who I loved and died for. But more importantly than keeping watch is praying. Praying that you will not fall into temptation. Because it's only through prayer that we're able to draw close to God. And as we draw close to God, we begin to see and we begin to sense the areas that we're being tempted. Keep watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. I have a challenge for each of us, and I'm going to do this myself is that for the next seven days, at least during some point in the next seven days, I challenge each of us to do a technology fast. And if you're uncertain what a technology fast is, it, you can kind of make up exactly what the rules that you want to abide by for it, but it could be something fasting from a specific type of technology saying, not going to watch TV for a certain amount of time. I'm not going to watch movies. I'm not going to sit in front of a computer. I might even take an iPhone fast. <laughs> I'll let you determine whether you're going to focus your technology fast or whether you're going to be very broad and say anything that uses something called a battery or something called an outlet 
could constitutes technology. And then I would challenge you to make the fast a specific length of time. I'm gonna shoot for 24 hours, but predetermine a period of time to fast for. And if you say something like six hours, I might recommend that you choose six awake hours because it's cheating if you say, I'm gonna technology fast while I sleep because each and every one of us can do that without really thinking that hard. And that kind of cheapens the challenge. But during technology fast, I would say that at some point in it, Pull out your Bible, an actual physical Bible. So you're not tempted to cheat electronically. So you're not tempted to cheat electronically. And open it up to a spot that you might not normally read. And pray, just a short prayer. Say, God, is there something that you want to share with me? And read a chapter or a few chapters out of the Bible and look for something that you may not have noticed before. I tr trust me, I've done this numerous times, and every time that I've done this, and I've pushed past what's typically on the surface, I've found other interesting ideas, interesting things that I would not have ever seen before. And the benefit of using the Bible, honestly, is that it uh, challenges you both spiritually and intellectually, so you can kind of keep from falling asleep in both of those areas. And as we close today, we're gonna say that the devil tries to trap us. The devil tries to get us to fall asleep. But next week, we're going to open door number three and see how we can honestly be able to continually place God first in our lives.